Okay, so we're back for our third and final one. And the key word that you need to remember for, two key phrases that you need to remember for this particular um, section is symbolic landscape and individual talent. With Ezra Pound, we have looking at the images as they were juxtaposed together. With T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J.F. or Prufrock, what we're going to look at is this idea of symbolic landscape. But before we do that, we're going to give, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on T.S. Eliot himself. And then I'm also going to ask you to pause the video and go listen to a reading of The Love Song of J.F. or Prufrock. And you should listen to it all. Uh, the way that you get to that is by clicking on the other URL I put in your email. So T.S. Eliot, so we're starting on page 2287 of our anthology for T.S. Eliot. Uh, he was very similar to Samuel Taylor Coleridge, one of our romanticists, in that he was not only a poet, but he was also a literary critic. And T.S. Eliot was a very famous literary critic. He started this movement called New Criticism, which uh, sparked a huge American movement. And it actually, what it requires you to do is never to look at the history of a particular poem or a text but to consider the poem as its own contained packet. You don't even look at the intentional, uh, the intention of the author. He called that the intentional fallacy. He also dealt with this idea of the effective fallacy. You don't look at what the reader believes about the particular poem or the piece of work. You just continue reading the particular piece as it is presented to you as a whole. Okay, and I'll get to that in just a second. On page 2287, you have a whole introduction to T.S. Eliot, which is very helpful in the first instance to talk about his biography, but I want us to be careful that we don't get too deeply into biographies of our particular authors and poets, because then we get into the trap of equating whatever it is they're writing with the biography of the poet himself or herself, or in the case of Mrs. Dalloway, um, with Virginia Woolf herself. So let's just keep that in mind as we move forward. On 2287, we really get into the style in which T.S. Eliot writes. And he says, this is a little below the, the, thing, the quotation marks around the metaphysical poets. Uh, it says, this remark from Eliot's essay, The Metaphysical Poets from 1921, gives one clue to his poetic method from proof rock through the wasteland. Again, the wasteland, if you are an English major, you should try to read it. When he settled in London, he saw poetry in English as exhausted with no verbal excitement or original craftsmanship. He sought to make poetry more subtle, more suggestive, and at the same time, more precise. Like the images, he emphasized the necessity of clear and precise images. From the philosopher poet T.E. Hume and from Pound, he learned to fear what was seen as romantic self-indulgence and vagueness, and to regard the poetic medium rather than the poet's personality as the important factor. So what I want you to get out of that particular point is that he's turning away from what he calls romantic self-indulgement and vagueness, and that he enjoys this idea of symbols and images. So when you're going to start to read The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, I know you guys, you're looking for plots and narrative things that you really enjoyed when you read something like The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, or you guys really came alive when we discussed Oscar Wilde's play, because there was plot, and there was narrative, and there was irony in Wilde and humor that we didn't always get unless we started doing close reading of the words themselves. Well, T.S. Eliot wants us to do that with poetry, close reading. And this is a skill that everybody needs to learn before they get out of any humanities class, because it's going to help you with everything. So this is what T.S. Eliot wants to do with, with his own poem, Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So let's continue on. On 2288, in that first full paragraph, it starts to give you an idea of what, who T.S. Eliot is as a poet. Eliot's real novelty and the cause of much bewilderment when his poems first appeared was his deliberate elimination of all merely connective and transitional passages. You're shaking, you're nodding your head right now. If, you, if, you, if you've if you read the love song of J. Alpha Prufrock, you're probably doing this. The hell does it mean? There's, I can't tell. How does one stanza go into the next stanza? It doesn't, but it does. All right, we'll get to that in just a second. His building up of the total pattern of meaning through the immediate juxtaposition of images without overt explanation of what they're doing. 
This is one of the other things that he does. Together with his use of oblique references to other works of literature, some of them quite obscure to most readers of his time. So literary allusions. That's why you get so many footnotes on the, his particular poems. So I hope you didn't ignore those completely when you're reading the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, because there's a lot coming in, especially with the opening epitaph um, in, uh, in Italian. How many of you speak Italian? I don't think anybody in the class speaks Italian. And remember, we had the Italians come up for us with the Italian Renaissance and, and Robert Browning, so this isn't the first time that we're seeing the cross-pollination with Europe. And remember, with Blast, we just had them, um, the people who are the vorticists, um, being a little insecure about the European movements. And so Italy is in Europe, just to remind you guys. And so now we start to see we've got all this cross-pollination of literature in one single poem. It's brilliant. You have to read it a couple of times, though, because who knows why women come and go talking of Michelangelo or if you should roll your trousers up, or if you should eat a peach, or if you see mermaids. He takes the most blissful images that you could imagine and puts them against something that's very startling or stark, or uses a meter that's not consistent throughout any of them. He does use refrains over and over again in this particular poem, but it's called a love song, which is odd. It's not like an ode that we saw with truth is beauty, beauty is truth, that's all you need to know. That's melodic. We also had that moment in that poem, which one was it? Where un unheard melodies are sweeter. So though Eliot is going to reject the romantics, there's a lot of things coming from the romantics back into Eliot. Not nature, um, not the, the, the symbolism of the poet hero, but we do have references to things that are quotidian. Eating a peach. Well, mermaid's not quotidian, but you guys know what I mean. Yeah. So um, J. Alfred Prufrock starts on 2289, and one of the things I want you to think about in the back of your head is, how is this similar or different from lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey? Or how is this different from The Lady of Shalott? Or how is this different from Sonnets from the Portuguese by uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning? Right? What I want you to do right now uh, is just stop, pause, and I want you to listen to T.S. Eliot reading The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. It's eight minutes long, and then we'll come back. Okay, so now that you've listened to the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, read by T.S. Eliot himself in that austere tone, you should have started to capture some of the consonants and the way that uh, you can speak when you read this particular poem. What I want to do now is give you just a little tiny bit of this bio. I want to talk about him as a critic, and then I want to give you some things about the poetic form in general, and then I'll go over a couple of the first stanzas to start talking about the way the images play off of each other. So T.S. Eliot was born 1888 and, and um, died in 1965, so he lived through a lot of the 20th century and some of the horror that was going on. Uh, the Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock was his breakout poem. He worked with Ezra Pound on The Wasteland, and in fact, there's a lot of controversy about The Wasteland itself. It was this huge, long, voluminous poem that Ezra Pound then came in and edited and really started to reshape into the great thing that it is. The, the, so the deal is, who's the author, Ezra Pound or T.S. Eliot? We can debate that later. Um, T.S. Eliot also wrote this very seminal article called um, Tradition, Tradition and Individual Talent, in which he really gets away from this idea of individual talent. Uh, he says that the poet loses himself to the poem and becomes only the medium, only the vehicle. Right? Only So the poet writes himself away as the act of creativity is happening. Uh, this is very different from the way the other people have seen uh, the creative genius. And I just want you guys to remember that as we move forward in the rest of the semester, because we won't see that again. There is no, not going to be the same kind of lauding of poetic and creative genius that we had in the 19th and the 18th century. So the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock was composed and published 1910 to 1911. 
It uses literary allusions, uh, which means that it makes references to outside literary sources. Uh, it uses a melodic poetic form, very much like a lyrical ballad, but in a way that is so abrupt because it doesn't make it doesn't have the kind of narrative that a lyrical ballad does and remember lyrical ballads were what Wordsworth and Coleridge originally uh, experimented with in 1798. A uh, love song of J. Alfred Prufrock builds on dramatic monologues of similar to Robert Browning. It breaks that unified vo voice by uh, juxtapositions and transitions of images. It adds violent, disturbing imagery. You have to ask yourself why, a particular, in particular, a love song, because there's no lover and there's no beloved, right? There's no object of affection and there's no muse. It uses concrete images to suggest the abstract. It's lots of references and layering. All illusions end up being a conflict, self-struggle, is hopelessness. It also represents modern humanity. Think about what you just heard in terms of BLAST and what BLAST authors consider to be humanity. Everybody, a classless system. Very utopic. I don't think the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is very utopic because nobody is happy here and there no, doesn't seem to be as many politics to govern the people. And in fact, where are the people? and who is the speaker. Uh, in Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, in terms of this representation of modern humanity, you can't penetrate a habit, custom, or cliché to get something substantial in this particular um, poem. You have to wonder if there's evidence of rebellion. Blast was all about rebellion. But you have to wonder if, other than the literary style, if there's evidence of rebellion in the content of this poem. Is there evidence of gender rebellion? Is science dissected? And any of the disciplines that have become modernized in the 20th century. In the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, the poet is not the prophet. And it does not have a conclusion. There's no ending. It just stops as if life is going to go on for J. Alfred Prufrock. Let's start with the title.